Okay, hello and welcome back to episode 107 of the Market Maker podcast. You have to excuse my voice, still recovering from a touch of the man flu uh, at the moment. So I'll, I'll do my best. It might get a bit croaky towards the end. So I'm going to have to lean on you, I'm afraid, Here's this episode. Well, I'm used to carrying you, you know, so. That's it. Business as usual. Uh, this, is just, this is my role my role is to make you shine so <laughs> you know, give you the airwaves but look we'll we'll discuss a few things in this episode so a little bit different last couple we've been quite concentrated on specific topics but this week overall i'm not going to say it was dull because there's plenty of stuff going on but there hasn't been like a one major killer blow for markets so we're going to talk a little bit about the equity rally the bull market that we're in. So we'll talk a little bit about that for the technology sector in particular. Then on the other side, not doing so well are the bankers, global deal making having its weakest start to the year in a decade. And linked to that, we had one of the big first US financial names report their Q1 numbers. Jefferies, their investment banking fees got hammered. Is this a sign of things to come for the upcoming earnings season? That's not for another two weeks or so. So a good litmus test for how they might perform, some of those other financial institutions. And then UBS, still in the spotlight, of course, following the Credit Suisse transaction. And they've brought back a very uh, senior figure to the fold. Uh, he's been called to arms. So we'll explain a little bit about who Sergio Omotti is and then to finish things off, we'll have a quick chat about gold because this month, it's the 31st of March, we're recording this, set to be the first month of net inflows into gold ETFs for about 10 months. So might be quite obvious why, but there's some interesting underlying kind of dynamics to be aware of as well. We can discuss and we'll look to wrap things off with a little bit of Apple because they've introduced Apple Pay later to allow consumers to pay for purchases over time and whether or not that is going to make a big difference to them or their competitors, of course. Saw the Klarna guy tweeting this morning saying, what was it? Imitation is the greatest form of flattery, he tweeted this morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh... Oh yeah, whatever, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but look, let's kick things off with the NASDAQ. I mean, I was just looking at the charts. We're still holding up pretty much at the best levels uh, as, as we stand toward the end of the week. NASDAQ 100 in the middle of the week, Wednesday, for the, for the first time in nearly three years, moved into a bull market. And technology stocks outperforming, of course, helping that. A um, couple, of, couple of figures then to, to just add into this. So, well, I guess, first of all, why don't you give us the definitions of these, these terminologies that we, that, that we hear get referred to? Yeah, well, bull markets, bear markets, uh, corrections. Um, so there's, there's a rule, rule for all this stuff. So it's when you're talking about any market, right? But normally when you're talking about the big stock indices, these terms are rolled out. Um, so a bull market is just a situation where the current price um, moves more than 20% above the recent low, or whenever the low was, if you're now 20% above that low, then technically speaking, that's what we call a bull market. So when you're looking at the NASDAQ, then um, the low, well, we kind of had, a, we basically had a triple bottom September, or sorry, October, uh, November, December. Um, you could even call it quadruple, start of January as well. You had this kind of big technical sort of bottom formation. Um, and then this year, it's just launched to the upside. Um, and actually, so quarter one, it just so happens the low was basically on the 5th of January, right? And that was at 10,700 on the NASDAQ. And here we are knocking on the door nearly of 13,000, currently trading 12,960. So yeah, technically speaking, that is just a whisker over 20% move um, to the upside. So that's a bull market. A bear market is just the opposite. That's when your the current price is 20% below the recent high. And then a correction is kind of in the middle. A correction is a 10% drop from recent highs. So that's just the kind of 
technicals of it all. Um, but I'm quite interested. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. I would say that officially we are in a bull market for, for the NASDAQ. Kind, kind of seems a bit odd to be saying those words, given kind of what's been going on over the last few weeks. But yeah, last few weeks, like mass layoffs at all the tech firms. Yeah. And I mean, I think there's two things to talk about here. Firstly, what about the other markets? Obviously, the NASDAQ is just tech. So tech has been a, a big outperformer in 2023. But when you kind of have a look at the S&P 500, for example, over the same period since, so quarter one of 2023, the S&P, well, what do you think? I mean, it's up, but without kind of calculating, what's your broad guess? The Nasdaq's up 20%. What do you reckon the S&P should be up? Five. Ooh, okay, you've gone, you've gone low ball there. All right, it's actually seven. So the S&P is up 7%. Bearing in mind that 25% of the S&P is tech. Mm. Tech has smashed it. Mm -hmm. um, so actually 7% is, I mean, that's surprisingly low, I would say, relatively. Um, the FTSE 100, quarter three, 2% up. Oh, come on, the UK. The good old, <laughs> the good old FTSE 100 a smash to two percent. Well, we, you know, London also lost its title. I saw, according to a City of London survey, about the financial capital of the world is no longer London for the first time in quite a long time. What, what, what do you, what's, what's, how do you measure what the well, financial yeah, capital of the world remember. is? Because I would say London probably lost that a <laughs> long time ago this was a survey run by the city of london corporation peers okay <laughs> they finally admitted yeah to they're like come on guys you're about like 50 points off every other tracker here <laughs> you're gonna have to bite the bullet um look the footsies obviously hasn't performed well because there's it's very heavyweight banks Mm -hmm. compared to these other indices like the S&P or obviously certainly the NASDAQ. So given recent events, then for sure, the FTSE 100 index has suffered more than most. But um, so, yeah, I guess that's one thing, right? Just to say the tech sector has certainly outperformed. Um, but like what's going on? Because it's a bit strange given this banking crisis. And as you're saying, looming recession fears and all the rest of it and you're like well how the hell does that work well i think it's a kind of a function of an unwind of last year's trade because last year tech underperformed and was trending lower all year because of higher interest rates and because of the fact that the outlook for interest rates in the future remained you know more hikes more hikes interest rates higher for longer inflation staying stubbornly high, you know, more hikes, more hikes, more hikes. And, and ultimately, technology is an interest rate sensitive sector. And that's, we talked about this, it's about growth stocks generally, you know, their valuations today are very much, you know, that today's valuation is built out of those, that future growth um, and the future revenues and the future profits, okay? But of course, if interest rates are higher, well, then you've got to discount that future cash flow. So future profits becomes less valuable today. And so 2022 was just all about that. It was revaluing growth and tech stocks in particular, factoring in now a higher interest rate environment, discounting those future profits. Now, this year has kind of flipped a bit, hasn't it? Because the interest rate outlook has now shifted. Um, and it's shifted really in the last few weeks, really because of the banking crisis, because of SVB, all of a sudden, everyone's kind of pivoted their expectations. And like right now, um, and actually to put some numbers on this. So in December, the market implied Fed funds rate, um, oh, sorry, not in December, sorry. The market implied Fed funds rate for December, 2023, put more simply, what will Fed interest rates be at the end of this year? 
markets were pricing in at the start of March, so pre, pre SVB, they were pricing in rates at five and a half percent at the end of this year. Now, fast forward four weeks, they're now pricing in 4.3%. So that's a huge change in future rate expectations. Markets are pricing in rate cuts. So that's now the opposite to that 2022 story. So that's why tech stocks are smashing it here, because our interest rate expectations have pivoted. And, and to kind of tie that in as well, you had HSBC Global Private Bank come out earlier uh, this week talking about that the greenback is likely to be dragged lower by an economic slowdown in the US and the Fed winding down its campaign if interest rate increases in the second half of 2023. And they were kind of warning about bracing for an extended period of dollar weakness, what they were talking about. Yeah. I mean, I don't know whether to, uh, I have a personal opinion here, which um, is just, I stress, just my personal opinion. Uh, but I think that maybe we're in a little bit of a, I, I don't think this is sustainable, this NASDAQ move, this tech stock rally, I don't think is sustainable in the short term. Um, and that's just because I think, again, we've probably got, I think we've got a bit carried away again with these rate expectations. So the idea of the Fed are going to start cutting at the end of this year. I mean, I would say that, firstly, they're data dependent now. So they've moved to the position of being data dependent. And currently, we think they might hike once more. Then there's going to be a recession and they're going to start cutting. That's what markets think. But... Um, they're only going to start cutting if inflation starts to come down, right? And is inflation going to come down? I mean, we're going to find out. We actually got some data today, the PCE figures from the US. Um, uh, and we'll see. We had European inflation figures this morning. Um, and if you get your FTs out and read the headlines, you're like, oh, wow, inflation's dropped by much more than expected, except that's not the important part because underlying that, the core inflation reading continue to go up so yes the energy costs are coming down right but if you take out the energy costs the underlying inflationary situation is still moving higher we had we had higher than expected inflation figures in the uk as well right so i'm not sure that this inflation thing is tamed i i think inflation is going to stay higher and therefore the fed are going to find it hard to be able to cut rates so then you move to the next idea. Well, if they, therefore, if they do end up cutting rates this year, it's going to be because we have a big recession. And then you're like, well, okay, if you have a big recession, well, we'll surely stock markets, you know, they're not pricing a big recession at this point. So they're kind of rallying because we're going to get rate cuts at the end of the year without quite realizing the scenario that would need to play out in order for those rate cuts to happen. So I, I think these, I think a lot of investors in the short term have got a bit carried away. They're kind of in old school mode, buy the dip, you know, money's super cheap and, and we're just not living in that world anymore. Mm. You, you sound a little bit like Michael Burry. I don't know if you saw <laughs> that tweet that he put out. I didn't see his tweet, but yeah, I'm, I'm definitely more in his camp these days. What's, right. what's he saying? So he, he originally tweeted, sell, referring to equities. When? <laughs> I think this was, um, but probably I think at the bottom of the bull market. <laughs> right. And so the, the <laughs> meme that was in circulation yesterday was that he tweeted again and said, I was wrong. <laughs> and actually, I mean, credit to him, right, for like coming out and just, you know, yeah. taking accountability for that. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll hook you, hook you guys up. But let's tie in gold then, perhaps, of all the different subject matter we were talking about. Yeah. So how does how does gold fit into that mix that you've described, and does that then lend its hands to why? it's an attractive investment at the moment. That stat was 
that March will be the first month of net inflows into gold ETFs for 10 months, while the volume of bullish options bets tied to funds has approached record levels as well. Yeah, I think, so gold's trading just shy of $2,000, okay? Um, we've had a big rally just in the last couple of weeks. But really, we've had a really big rally over the last four months because if you go back to the start of November, we kind of had a bottom out at around $1,600 and it's rallied to 2000 okay? So we've had a big move higher. 2000 is a really critical kind of line in the sand in terms of a price point for gold. We, we've breached it. Um, well, let me go back further on my chart just to make sure. Yeah, we kind of breached it uh, briefly in August 2020 during the, obviously, the kind of first round of COVID. Um, we then breached it again very briefly, March 2022. Um, but each time it was a move above 2000, hardly for hardly any period and then down, right? So we've never sustained a move above 2000. And you're now seeing people starting to say, this is the time. Um, I don't know. I would say that the banking crisis particularly was very positive for gold, not only because gold is a, a safe haven, right? But, but all of a sudden you have people looking for places to park their hash, you know, other than the usual place of, well, I'll just put it in my bank account. And so I think gold was a particularly, um, you know, go-to vehicle for some of these deposits that are getting pulled out of banks. Now, I think will gold break 2000 now and, and push higher? I think it will if the banking crisis, the SVB crisis, the Credit Suisse crisis, if it's not over, then yeah, sure. But you know, when we talk about the NASDAQ bull market, you know, people are getting more confident that the banking crisis is, has now finished. And, you know, that whole risk is going away. So I think gold above 2000, I don't know. I'm not quite as bullish, maybe, as, as some are. Mm. Um, I How, think it's definitely tied to that banking crisis. Could you explain this element then? There was a piece in the FT where it was a metals analyst at Standard Chartered, and they were talking about the collapse of SVB and Signature, massive increase in tactical positioning, safe haven, so on. Fine. They also said, in previous crises, this impact has been offset by other investors being forced to sell gold to meet margin calls and other investments. However, yeah. this analyst said that months of investor outflows have meant the positioning was light at the start of the latest problems, reducing right. the amount of further selling. Right. That makes sense, right? Because... Yeah, one thing that stops go gold going higher in a moment of crisis is people that need liquidity and need cash. They've got margin calls to cover. Where do you get where do you get your cash from? Well, okay, I'm going to have to sell some asset that I own in order to raise capital to kind of plug that margin call, right? So the go one of the go to assets to sell is gold. So you sell gold, ironically in a crisis, because if all you think gold is for is a safe haven, well, you should be buying it in a crisis and it should only ever go up. But yeah, there's, you've got to kind of go beyond that and people selling to cover margin calls. But the point here in that article was that there, there weren't many people who owned gold in a way, right? So it wasn't, it's no longer the go-to asset necessarily to sell to raise cash for other use. And so, yeah, that that sell side downside pressure has been less strong now than in previous times, which yeah. of course helps it move higher. Mm -hmm. Cool. Right. Well, let's, let's pivot and let's talk a little bit about global deal making. I don't think it will come as much of a surprise to anyone <laughs> that it's been the weakest start of the year in a decade. Um, to give you a couple of percentages, the value of mergers and acquisitions fell 45% year over year to 550 and a half billion US dollars, the largest decline since Q1 of 2001. Europe was the slowest performing region, activity down 
followed by US down 47%, and APAC was down 24%. Anything in there that m- maybe the percentages? Yeah, that, I mean, they're huge, especially like these are year on year percentages, right? And like 2022 wasn't good either. Um, I mean, really, 2022, it was more quarter one was the best quarter in that year, but it was a really bad year, right? So these year on year comps, you know, to have a massive drop again of these magnitudes is, is, yeah, just showing just how desperately bad deal flow is still. Um, And I think some of the only deals that are going through is predominantly based in healthcare. Yeah. The kind of larger magnitude deals. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, exactly. So, you know, if you took out some of the, the super big deals, and there haven't been many of them, like Pfizer bought CGEN for $43 billion, right? That, that one deal is $43 billion. You know, out of a total of $550 billion, that's almost 10% of that entire total, right? So mm-hmm. if you kind of took that Pfizer deal off the, it, it's kind of, it's even worse. So, yeah, but the biggest percentage decline in deal flow since 2001 um so yeah this is this is properly bad um and europe's um the worst the worst of it i mean it's not a surprise that it's bad i mean i think it is a surprise it's that bad but your big headwinds um are are, are all the obvious stuff it's rising interest rates as of course made financing these particularly these larger deals more expensive. So what we have seen is the number of deals has been quite, you know, strong, um, but the value of them has been really low. So I think you've had quite a lot of activity on the small to mid size and just hardly anything coming through on that that big, big top level. And that's one is because interest rates make financing more expensive. Um, Obviously, we've had valuations collapse. And so If companies are able to not raise capital, what I mean by that is, have they got enough cash flow? You know, uh, have they got enough working capital to continue? Because some companies, they don't have that luxury. They're running out of cash. They're trying to reduce their cash burn by cutting costs like the Elon Musk, you know, Twitter, um, initiative that sparked a lot of cost cutting in the tech sector particularly right so people are trying to cut costs so that their their kind of runway is extended delaying their need to raise capital because the problem with raising capital now you know having to have a massive down round right where you're raising capital at a valuation that is way 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 lower than the valuation you raised cash at last time. Okay, so let's say in the, if you raised cash in 2021 in the bubble, then you had valuations that were crazy high, right? Well, um, so I can give you an example that will connect within some of the other themes we'll talk about. But Klarna. Yeah. So Klarna had an initial price tag. It, they got as high as $46 billion. US dollars. I think it was less than a year later. Yeah. They had a funding round and it put their valuation at 6.7. Ouch. Oh, yeah. I never felt, well, what's the saying? I would have never felt so poor if I hadn't tasted such riches. That <laughs> poor guy, huh? He was on there. I remember he was on the diary of a CEO, that podcast. What the Klarna founder? Klarna, Klarna founder, and the title of the podcast episode was even like "From Zero to Forty Six Billion," and it was and back to him. zero. Back. <laughs> they can do another episode. Back to back to zero again. Well, yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure. To be fair, credit to him, he's probably learned a lot <laughs> through that process. Yeah. I'm sure. But but so this is this is a serious headwind to deal flow. Because companies are desperately trying to avoid raising capital if they can, because yeah, the the, the discounts are just unbelievable. Um, so obviously, investors don't want to have to mark to market their book. You know, if you bought, if you were in the round 
where Klarna raised at 46 billion, you know, what's your what's your investment worth now? You know, it's it's collapsed, right? Um, so they're trying to put off. And so obviously this means deal flow volume is much lower. And then obviously we've had a banking crisis, which clearly isn't going to help either. Um, so you've, yeah, you've got these kind of, you might say three big headwinds that are all related. I mean, ultimately all of those things are about interest rates moving higher super fast, okay? Valuations collapsing, obviously the cost of money going up and the banking crisis is all wrapped up into this super aggressive rate hiking cycle that's fed into, yeah, deal flow. And regionally, it's quite interesting. You mentioned that Europe, Europe are down 63% year on year in terms of, um, in terms of deal, deal flow. Um, uh, that compares to the US down 47% and then Asia Pacific down 24%. Um, so certainly Europe that seems to be the big loser here. Um, but the activity, yeah, I've got a chart here which is showing the activity, you know, where these deals that are happening, yeah, healthcare and technology uh, are the big two. And the, the ones where you're seeing virtually no action at all is down in like media, telecoms, retail, consumer staples, you're getting virtually no action down there whatsoever. Mm. Um, so the numbers we had from, from Jeffries then this week, not that surprising on that side. Their investment banking revenues were down about 42%. That was actually worse than what the street was expecting. On the flip side, though, I think their trading division was really strong. I think it was their capital markets division. I think it was their fourth highest revenue figure they've had in their history. So given all of the macro environment you've discussed, still that imbalance it feels like a bit of a copy paste repeat from where we were from last earnings season so when we think about the other bigger banks that formally kick off the official reporting season that's not until the 14th of april when we get jp morgan city and then the rest follow thereafter is earnings season not really for the banks at least that big a deal oh i'd say it's a massive deal for the banks just because, I mean, yeah, all right. If you've got both sides, right? If you've got an investment banking division that's performed really badly, we expect, given deal flow, and Jeffrey's confirming that. If you've also got the kind of sales and trading market side, then fine, that's going to offset it. That's done really well. That side of the bank performs really strongly when markets are super volatile, which of course they have been. That means they make money from trade flow right trade volume so when markets are all kicking off volumes are steeply higher and that's how they make their money okay so fine that, that can be offset but we've just had a banking crisis right so all these banks when they're reporting their earnings everyone's going to be right what's going on let's have a look at your deposit book has your deposit book declined mm. you know what's the deposit outflows um, are you put and there's there going to be a lot of questions about well hang on all those securities that you're those hold to maturity securities that you've got sat on your balance sheet you know what's the actual value of those please you know why aren't you marking to market because actually the value of those is a lot lower right this is what this was what happened with svb okay so i think that banks will be under a huge amount of attention given that we've had this banking crisis mm. will it spark and flare up another episode of the banking crisis? I think it's the big question, um, yes or no, and I don't know the answer to that. Mm. We'll see. Um, but, yeah, I, I think this earnings season is really key, just stepping outside of the financial sector and looking at it more broadly. You know, you got the NASDAQ in a bull market up 20%. Um, and I think, actually, the next few weeks are really important because – we're going to start to see the earnings. So how have companies performed in quarter one? But more importantly, what's their outlook going forwards? And we've got a recession coming, right? So what, what do they think about that? And how is that impacting their forecasts for revenues and profits? And it, and it may be that we start to get some decent-sized revisions lower on their outlook for the rest of 2023. And that could be a negative uh, sort of catalyst. Um, but then also... You know, the next phase of data, so jobs data out of the US, inflation data 
you know, if the banking crisis is done and it's behind us, well, look, it's back to inflation, isn't it? And what's happening to inflation? And that's what the Fed are going to make their decisions based on. And so I think the next few weeks with earnings season and then another round of monthly data is, is going to be really key. And yeah, is this, is this stock market rally, is it sustainable or not? Mm. Sustainable, the tech firms will say what an awesome job they've done with streamlining their businesses. Yeah. And let's just talk up uh, generative AI a little bit more. Let's juice that narrative. And then well, the, bank, it... the banks, I, I don't know with the banks, I was thinking from an information flow point of view, banks are very good at priming the market for bad news. Yeah. And if there was going to be some skeletons that come out and questions of the magnitude that you mentioned, probably you've still got time, right? These things tend to come out nearer to the time of release of the official information. Maybe it's a bit early, but I don't know. I just think you should have heard about this sort of stuff already. There's been Maybe. enough of a microscope on yeah. these financial firms to unearth and extract those kind of skeletons that you were alluding to. So, yeah, you're probably right. <clears throat> Let's see. You're probably right. But I think with the tech sector, I think there's certain companies like Facebook is a really good example, or Meta, I should say, where their costs were out of control. And that was hammering their share price because investors were losing faith in Zuckerberg's, you know, Holy Mary pass to try and get this meta thing to, to dominate the, the meta environment in the future. And it's just throwing everything at it. And so they've pivoted and started to go through a big cost cutting exercise. Sure. So should the meta share price rebound strongly? Yeah. And it, and it has because it was so depressed. Um, so, but that's an extreme example, right? I mean, tech, yeah, they're going through cost cutting rounds, but there's most tech company stocks weren't as depressed as Meta's. So in theory, there should be less of a rebound sort of opportunity, which is another reason why I think this NASDAQ rally perhaps can't go much further, but. Okay, well, look, let's, let's two more stories quickly to, uh, to wrap things up. So sticking with the banking sector first, you had a chap called Sergio Amotti, got pulled back into the fray, which is Credit Suisse. Um, so maybe perhaps a little bit of background about our dear Sergio. Do yeah. You know much about this guy? Well, <clears throat> he's, you know, he's the kind of super experienced, <clears throat> excuse me, um, safe pair of hands. Like we need heavyweights at this moment because UBS, us as a bank, we've just taken on Credit Suisse in this fire sale. We've now got a bank that's the fourth biggest in the world. It's got 120,000 employees. It's got $5 trillion under management. You know, this is maybe one of the most important moments in, the, in UBS's 161 year history. 2023 and 2024, if the deal gets done, I would say it's going to be a super, super, really important moment in their history, right? Now, the guy they had in charge, Hammers, was quite fresh. He was quite a fresh new boy on the block. Um, he came in replacing uh, Motti in late 2020. Um, they got him from the Dutch bank ING, which is a much, much, much smaller bank, um, for sure. And secondly, um, ING didn't, you know, they don't do, like UBS's two main business lines are investment banking and wealth management. And ING don't really do those. And so it was like, well, okay. When he did come in in 2020, it was like, mm, not sure that's a great fit. Um, but UBS have been doing fine, right? So. I think he was proving the doubters wrong, but Axel Weber was the chairman of UBS. Not He's not now, but he was when Hammers was signed in 2020. And the idea was that he'd come in under a strategy of cutting costs and developing a stronger digital strategy, right? And, and you know, 
So there was always question marks about Hammers and Keller, who's now the UBS chairman. Basically, the story goes that Keller was, you know, they, they, there was a conference call, a hastily arranged conference call, you know, in the middle of the night during this Credit Suisse crisis. And Keller was watching Hammers um, field questions from analysts and basically not doing a very good job. I think the word was, he was fumbling questions from analysts. And I think at that point, Keller was like, oh my God, this guy's, this guy's not our guy for what will now be one of the most important moments in our history. So he immediately got on the phone to Ermotti, who had been the UBS chief executive for nine years before Hammers came in. And it was like, we need this guy back. We need a heavyweight here to come and step in. And apparently they went out for dinner the next night and the deal was signed. Oh, so God knows what the money, the uh, what money's involved here. <laughs> oh, Sergio. <laughs> so yeah, it's bad. It makes sense. I mean, I think I think it is a uh, yeah. This is what chairmen are for. You know, it's making the big calls at the right times, mm. being brave, and you know, recognizing probably a change is needed, and then having the balls to just you know, immediately execute it. Um, yeah, and his background, I, when I was reading at the time, was at that point of when he came in, in that nine-year um, position that he held at UBS, restructuring, pivoting business strategy, and restructuring was getting rid of investment banking, you know, right. and dealing as well with a lot of litigation at the time as well, which is, that's all coming down the pipe. For sure. Absolutely. Oh yeah. <laughs> so yeah, he's kind of it's a well trodden path uh, for him. But so look, let's let's go over to Apple then and talk the final one. They've kind of finally, I guess, come out and introduced yeah. Apple Pay later, a bit late to the game, or just inevitability it's going to happen. So does it make a great deal of difference? Um, it's that late to the game would be an understatement. I mean, we've been talking. God, we did a podcast, maybe one of our f first ever ones, I think, was about Apple. And they just bought, I can't even remember the details now, but they bought a UK company. And I can't remember the name of it now, but it was very much in the, you know, the, the kind of buy now, pay later sort of um, space. And it was like, ah, okay, Apple are coming. Okay, they are coming into this little sector, the buy now, pay later sector. And they are going to smash it up. Um, and it was like then the months went by and it was like, well, where are they? Um, and so, yeah, I don't know why. I'm not sure why it's taken so long. Who'd credit um, kudos? That right. Yeah, one? that's it. Yeah. The, the UK lot. Um, so, yeah, it's that, that's the first thing to say. It's like oh, about time. Um, and I don't know the details why it's taken so long. But look, it's here now, I guess. And the, you know, the, the big problem that the clowners of this world have is, yeah, the Apple, the, you know, the Apple ecosystem is a monster. And um, if I was the Klarna dude, you know, your valuation's at 6.7 billion now having been at 46, I mean, what's it going to be in 12 months' time or 24 months' time when Apple just ride roughshod all over you? Yeah, it? and to give it a bit of um, context, the service will be embedded in the iPhone operating system, which accounts for more than 50% of smartphones in the United States of America. Yeah. So it's like, just like that, update, bang, bang in your Click hand switch. now. 50% of all smartphones in America ready to roll. Yeah. So I don't know how you compete with, well, obviously Klarna, I mean, they don't have a platform like Apple. So they're, you know, they're reliant on other people's platforms. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I would fear for these, 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 these kind of other providers for sure. That's it. 
you know, just invest in the monopoly that are big tech and you'll, you'll do all right in the long run. But I don't know about like, this buy now, play, pay later thing, right? Uh, has really been a function of the zero interest rate environment, right? That That's really where it's been born out of, where a company can actually generate a profit off free lending, right? It's it's like buy now, pay later, 0% interest. But of course, they make their money by late payments. That, you know, they're, they're, they're relying on people overstretching, buying stuff they've got no right to buy. Oh, yeah, I'll buy it. You know, I don't have to worry about paying for it until later. And then later arrives and oh, I don't have the money. And then right, the interest rates on late payments are like super punitive. And so this is kind of how they make their money, right? Um, but yeah, this is when the cost of money was at zero. But I don't know, the cost of money's obviously gone up sharply. So that's going to squeeze their margins. Maybe that's why Apple delayed. Maybe it was just that macro view and the interest rate psych hiking cycle i don't know maybe that was the reason but well i was a bit disappointed because um i saw those i saw that collection of michael jordan trainers going on at sotheby's this weekend the and dynasty I was like, what i can only get buy now pay later a thousand bucks i need five million come on the dynasty collection oh you're all that, over that, that, that would go right there so hang on, what was it? It was the air seals, lighting. But these are shoes that the the man himself has worn. He wore in the final game of the of the championship of every one that he won from nineteen ninety one oh. through to nineteen ninety eight. It's the final game pair shoe, yeah, from each of his winning championships. Wow, so that's six shoes. That's got to be, I didn't realize it was the shoes from the final game of each of the championship winning. Oh, that's going to be more than 5 million. Yeah, it's going to break records. That's what they're saying. The, 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 the highest selling shoe at the moment as a single shoe, I think it was 1.8 million, which was um, Kanye's first um, kind of, before Yeezy became Yeezys, this was like right. the prototype that Nike had done for him. And it was the first time that Nike pivoted from um, sports star to musician with their own line of shoe. And, okay, and you know, the, the people who bought it were going to take the shoe and have digital fractional ownership right. via NFTs, actually. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Um, now that you've said that, $1.8 million, I reckon these six because it's six pairs here so they're all they're all going to be more than a million right this is going to be this could hit 10 million no i'm gonna to have to move a few things about to get to that <laughs> yeah right i'm gonna to have to sell my gold <laughs> right, gold's definitely not going above two thousand. that's it I'm margin right. call i need to buy these sneakers <clears throat> cool all right well look we'll wrap it up thanks as ever uh for listening thanks peers and everyone have a well, we, we're not actually going to have a, an episode next week. It's Easter, of course. Yeah. So I wish everyone uh, a great long Easter break and we'll be back thereafter. So take care, everyone. Have a good one.